All right. Next we have David Sands telling us about reconciling Shannon and Scott. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I've done my best to uh, adjust my uh, talk so that the bottom half of the screen uh, is uh, not needed quite as much as... Uh, <laughs> I, I wish you hadn't applauded because I, you know, I'm worried now that I haven't quite done as good a job as I should do. Let me, let me move on. I want to talk to you about something that is very dear to many of us, and that is information flow. Because the way that, that systems handle information flow is, is really central to many questions in, in security in particular, but not just security. And what we've done in this work is to provide a new mathematical structure for describing information flow. And the key ingredient of that is a definition of information. Now, information, please keep in mind, is not something that, that in some sense lives in a vacuum. Information is always about something. OK. This work is also, also a reconciliation, a story involving two superheroes. They're superheroes from different universes. On the one hand, we have Claude Shannon from the world of electrical engineering, and, and in particular, communication engineering. And on the other hand, we have Dana Scott from the world of logic and theoretical computer science. Our theory is going to be a combination of key ideas from these two worlds because we need a theory of information which takes into account both of these dimensions. Now, the first uh, that I'm going to mention is the one that I guess is best known to the public community, namely Dana Scott's theory. And it can be thought of as a theory of information. Sorry. Let's just move this a little higher. Too loud? Too quiet? It was too quiet. Too quiet. Is that better? That rarely happens. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So, Dana Scott's theory of information, domain theory, can be thought of as a theory of information in which How's that? Oh my. Whoa. Can you tweak that from your end? It's good? Sounds really loud to me, but there you go. Okay. So, Shannon's theory of information is from this famous paper 150,000 citations. Can you get that? Wow. Um, it's actually not a theory of information, as, as you can see from the title. In fact, it's a theory of communication, and it's not about actual information. In fact, one could say that, you know, generally, if you have two sources of information which produce information at the same rate, at the same entropy, that doesn't mean they're producing the same information. So a theory of rates of information is not the same as a theory of information. But actually, Shannon developed what we could call a real theory of information. Uh, and it's not this paper, but this, so the, the, what I have in purple here is an actually quote from a later paper, a paper from 53, entitled The Lattice Theory of Information. It doesn't have 150,000 citations. It has about 150. It, is, it has been said that of those 150, probably around 120 were accidental citations that were intended to cite the, uh, the famous paper. It has been known as a rather obscure paper, um, but I think um, the core idea deserves to be better known, and it is better known, it just is not better known under uh, Shannon's um, title. 
So let me explain Shannon's idea that he, he, he describes in this work about actual information. Let's suppose that we have an information source which is a color, red, orange, green, or blue. And we are going to observe this, uh, we're going to talk about the information of this as observed through a channel. For me, a channel would just be a function. It could be a stochastic process, but we're just going to view it as a function. So what's the function? Well, let's take this function, is primary. We're observing the input, as it were, the source of information through this function. And we're learning something about it. Now, we could think of this function as being the information itself. However, do we really care about the encoding? If I'd, if I'd written this as oui and non, instead of yes and no, would you say that it's different information? Well, Shannon's argument was that, no, this is not different information. It's just the same information represented in a different way. So Shannon's idea was that information could be understood as the channel modulo bijective modification. In other words, we can post-process this in some bijective way. We preserve the information. We just change the representation. So for example, this function here, Boston Taxi, takes a color and says go if it's green or orange, and says stop otherwise. This function is equivalent according to Shannon's view because you can define one of these in terms of the other and vice versa. And so the idea is that a theory of information should be independent of encoding. And so Shannon's view is that the elements of this theory of information are the channels modulo these bijective post-processing operations. Okay, um, that was that example. Let's look at another example. It's a, it's a function primary, not is primary, but primary, which gives you the primary color uh, uh, by, by writing it out as red or blue. And if it's not a primary color, it just says not primary. Okay, so in this example, we can see that is primary can be defin defined in terms of primary, but not vice versa. So what this tells us is that primary has more information than is primary. And thus, information elements themselves are ordered. So this is an ordered theory of information. OK, two functions here, is primary again, and is traffic light. It's not a traffic light if it's blue, otherwise it is a traffic light color. So is traffic light is incomparable to primary in the sense that neither can be defined by post-processing the other. And so what this tells us is that the theory is not only ordered, but it's partially ordered. Finally, the final ingredient to, to fill in this title is that we could notice that the function primary has more information than is primary, and it also has more information than is traffic light. And in fact, it is the smallest function which bounds both of those. In other words, it's the least upper bound. And in fact, for any set of information elements, including the infinite ones and the empty ones, there is a least upper bound for that. In other words, it's a complete lattice. So this was the idea, the core of Shannon's idea that, that by and large disappeared from the literature. Okay, I'll get back to that um, uh, historical uh, note shortly, but let me give you um, a, a, a slightly different insight. The way that we're going to view this here is that instead of viewing this in Shannon's terms as functions closed under these bijective post-processing, in fact, another way to see this as observed by Shannon is this is isomorphic to Instead of thinking of this as, as, as collections of functions, we can simply view it as equivalence relations or partitions of the input space of the function. And these partitions are just the kernels of those, the functions. So the kernel of this function is the partition we've drawn in this little cloud here. In other words, red and blue are indistinguishable in the outputs of this function, and green and orange are indistinguishable. So this lattice of information can be viewed alternatively as a lattice of partitions. And here's a little example involving the things that we've seen so far. 
a sub-lattice of the full lattice of information over this domain, uh, where the top element is the identity relation, the, uh, the partition where a single color is in each, uh, in each cell. That means we have full information about the color. At the bottom, we have everything is indistinguishable from anything else, one big fat partition, meaning we have no information. And we see the other three examples uh, illustrated in this sublattice. Now, we, we use partitions when we want to visualize these things, thinking of them in terms of their blocks. But an equivalent way of thinking about partitions is equivalence relations. And when we think in terms of equivalence relations, we think of them as sets of pairs of the related things in the relation. Okay, so this is a structure that actually is quite well known. Uh, it's just not well known as linked to, to Shannon's early paper. It's something that has been rediscovered in a number of contexts, and I name in particular ones that, that, that inspired the line of work that we're working on that go back to um, uh, Sebastian's uh, PhD thesis, in fact, on using partial equivalence relations for static analysis. But similar ideas arise completely independently elsewhere. For example, a paper by Lando and Redmond at CSF in 91, using an almost identical title uh, uh, to Shannon's, uh, namely a lattice of information. And similar ideas can be seen in earlier literature on, for example, models of polymorphic types, because polymorphism, parametric polymorphism, is intimately linked to uh, information flow properties. Models of epistemic logic, even in, in game theoretic uh, uh, analyses of economics and economics of information. Okay, so we generalize this view a little bit in this, in this kind of work. We're interested in not only what information is revealed by a computation, but we generalize it by saying, well, not only we're interested not only what information is revealed, but when we observe the output through the lens of another equivalence relation. Uh, so so we, we are often phrasing things in terms of these properties. Uh, some program P maps R equivalent things to S equivalent things. Pictorially, we have a, our partition R on the left and our partition S on the right. And what we're saying is that what can be uh, the S models what can be observed by a given observer. And what R models here is what abound on what can be learned. And using these kinds of properties, we can express a, a large variety of information flow properties, not just relatively simple ones uh, like standard notions of non-interference in security, but also various varieties of conditional uh, notions of information flow. Uh, okay, so, so what that means is, you know, we take an element in the, in the domain, it maps to some equivalence class of the codomain, and what this property means is that if we take any other element in the same equivalence class, it will also get mapped to the same equivalence class. Okay, so this is the story so far. We've looked at um, uh, these, um, we've introduced these two um, notions of computation. Now the question here is that, do we really want to always abstract away from the representation of data. And uh, let's suppose in this example that the, the blue input would be mapped to an undefined computation, whereas the other equivalence class, red, green, or orange, maybe is mapped to some def more defined computation. Are these, do, do we really mean that these, it doesn't matter what the encoding is? Well, clearly it does matter because we know that we can't just look at an undefined value and decide to do something else with it. In other words, our programming ability uh, is very much influenced by how well-defined the outputs are. Computable functions can't just recode this uh, bottom to something else. Uh, and so we see that if we take examples, here's a, here's a, a, a different example where we view a, view a program as a function from uh, an input x to an output stream, the, uh, if we just look at the first uh, eight values of this uh, program, it divides by two. We, these, this is the equivalence relation, the partition that we get. Zero and one are indistinguishable, and so on and so forth. Here's another program. 
that has exactly the same kernel. In other words, it reveals the same information according to the Shannon style lattice of information. However, it does so in a radically different way, whereas this one, when we see the output zero, we know it's a zero or one. When we see the output one, we know the input is two or three and so on. In this program, the equivalence classes are modeled by very different kinds of computation. A stream that doesn't do anything uh, will be the result of, um, um, if, if we don't get any output at all ever, we know that the input is zero or one, and so on and so forth. So the idea, the main contribution of our work is a, a lattice of computable information. What it does is take the ideas from Shannon's lattice of information and reconcile it with the SCOP information ordering by recognizing that it's important to understand not only what information is revealed, but in some sense how that information is re revealed with regard to the quality uh, of the output. And so the way that we do that, the way that we merge these theories, is to look at these equivalence classes in this example and actually partially order them to reflect the fact that the higher elements are revealed in some sense with a more uh, complete computation than the lower elements. And so what we've done is we have, um, we build a lattice of computer, computable information in which the elements of the lattice are not partitions, equivalence relations. They are something called complete pre-orders. Where do the pre-orders come from? That's just the partially ordered equivalence classes that I showed you. If you partially order a set of equivalence classes, that's just a pre-order. Completeness is uh, connected to um, the domain theoretic side. Um, our pre-orders must include the underlying domain structure, if there is such a thing. Uh, in the example, there wasn't, but there could be. And it must also, in some sense, preserve limits. So this gives a class of, uh, uh, they're, they're the elements of our theory. The ordering and the least upper bound operation are actually just the same as the ordering in the lattice of information. And so here's a quick example. If we start with this domain, a Y-shaped domain, then the lattice of information for this uh, is a structure with um, 14 elements. The bottom element is just the relation, the one big equivalence class like we had before. The top element is actually not the identity relation, but it's actually the underlying domain ordering because that's the most liberal that we can get. And we see that the, 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 the overall structure includes lots of different um, uh, elements. Interestingly, it, it's about the same number of elements as the lattice of information, even though we've added more structure. And the reason for that is because we've thrown away all the points in the lattice of information which make no computational sense, the points which cannot be the kernel of any computable function. Okay, the second contribution, and I haven't got time to go into the details, but I, I, I've just got a couple of words to say about it, so, so uh, don't panic. Um, the, um, the, the second main contribution is to use this theory to give the first, what I would claim to be the generalized notion of termination sensitive non-interference. A lot of buzzwords there, but what is, what is that? It's a weakening of information flow properties, of an information flow property called non-interference used to describe typically secrecy. Um, and the weakening itself is just to say, well, we ignore leaks which are conveyed purely by termination behavior. By modeling the fact, by making termination behavior explicit, we can now systematically ignore it. That's the key. And the reason you do this is because it's a natural approximation that arises in program analysis where you can't be bothered to do any kind of liveness. Um, okay, I'll talk, I, w I won't talk about the, the, the specific details of that, but you'll see in the paper that we take some examples uh, inspired by um, the use of power domains to describe um, non-determinism uh, and show how uh, an example that I don't think has been studied in this context uh, works out very nicely. Okay, last slide. Um, I just want to uh, summarize. We've introduced in this work a uh, lattice of computable information which combines the theories of information uh, from these two superheroes to derive a new model, um, which we show can um, not only express useful information in a well-structured way, but also uh, provide this first general 
uh, fully general uh, notion of termination insensitive information flow property independent of any particular application domain. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Andy Pitts, University of Cambridge. So, is there any prospect of introducing your two superheroes to an earlier one, the Reverend Bayes, uh, in the sense of bringing in stochastic or probabilistic uh, things into the picture? Yeah, so um, I think what one can say here is. Can you repeat the question? So, the, uh, the, the comment was you know, can we, can we introduce this, uh, can I introduce another superhero, the Reverend Bayes, uh, in, in, and, and think about probabilistic uh, dimensions? Interestingly, Shannon's paper is phrased in terms of probabilistic things, but really the probabilities are not, they, they do not uh, change the underlying structure. The underlying structure is combinatoric and not probabilistic. So I think that's maybe a general comment uh, that, that, you know, before you talk about the probabilities, you need to talk about the combinatorics. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think that observation has been made in, in other contexts. So I think it's compatible. We can we can associate probabilities with equivalence classes, for example. Um, um, but it, it, it maybe has certain fundamental limitations, uh, lack of, um, con um, not continuity, but um, uh, it, it becomes a very sensitive theory. When, that, when, a, when a probability gets extremely small uh, and then becomes zero, uh, equivalence classes disappear. And that's, uh, that's not, well uh, not well behaved from a probabilistic point of view. So maybe that's one of the reasons this was not pursued in the information theory community. Hi, I'm Anita from UMass Lowell. Um, this is probably related to your TINI work and more details of the paper, but I'm just looking for high-level intuition of the P map, which uh, where you map R to S, and R you said as the bound on the information, whereas S is what is allowed to be observed by an observer. So I'm trying to uh, map how non-interference can be viewed in this. Oh, setting. I see. Yeah, that's a good. That's a re very reasonable question. So um, when you when you phrase non-interference, what you typically do is say uh, which outputs are publicly observable. Uh, and mm -hmm. so we you typically do it by simple projection operation. You know, these are the low channels. And so that corresponds, the, the kernel of that function is the relation S. And what we're interested in is, is whether the, the inputs, uh, which are low, um, if, if they change, sorry, if the inputs, if you have two lo uh, low equivalent inputs, in other words, the non-secrets going in, in two different runs are the same, then we can't observe any difference. And so that low equivalence on the inputs, that corresponds to re relation R. And so uh, a simple non-interference property requires both of these. You, you, you're not only talking about what you learn about the input. We want to make sure you only learn the public inputs. We also want to say, well, that's not going to be the case if you could actually see the secret outputs. So we need to sort of also spe uh, specify that we're only going to look at the secret outputs. And that's the role of the relation S. Okay, yeah, thanks. We should move on, I'm afraid. Okay.